I'm Tammy Lee Meyer, and I am joined by Arthur Brock. Hi, Tammy. Thank you so much for joining and helping to share your journey as you are developing Scepter medic from Metacurrency, the whole the whole chain, and uh, and really bringing people together to be able to uh, work modeling this distributed system by being a distributed system and living in place together. That's amazing. Um, maybe we can just start with letting people know where you're at and uh, a little snapshot of what this summer's been. Sure. The connection just seems to have glitched for me. Is it glitched for you? Um, it did, but it doesn't seem to be, it's okay, I think. Okay. Yeah. Great. Um, yeah, so we have a team with people that are kind of scattered around the world, but we also have this crazy uh, summer residency program that we um, spun up uh, the, at a house near the beach in San Francisco, and there's like... 14 of us here in the house right now and another handful of people around the neighborhood. And um, we are planning to move our headquarters elsewhere, in particular outside of the US for a few months. Um, because where we are in our process is we're about to launch our crowdfunding campaign at ICO. And although we have taken many steps to um, make sure that there's nothing that we're doing that could be interpreted by the SEC, the Security and Exchange Commission in the US as something that would be um, breaking their rules. We actually don't even wanna be operating that whole thing inside this country, just to give them, it's sort of like we want, oh, we want lots of different ways to make sure that we're, we're not constrained um, by their policies um, for, we don't want that all narrowed down to some of the rules in the United States. Right. And there's, I think, a lot of, uh, a lot of shifting and changing in terms of systems. And obviously what's happening in the U.S. right now is is quite intense uh, and I think it's exciting to also include other countries in the development. Totally, I mean we, our intention is that this is really an international project and an inclusive project. Um, it's all open source and one of the things that I was excited about is that we created a, um, a uh, application scaffolding, sort of an application engine wizard to help you build a distributed holochain application. And we have that wizard up in six different languages right now. And that's without even having gotten to Spanish and French. We have like people fluent in those languages on our team. They just haven't done those languages yet. And I just like the idea that, uh, you know, many people could come in and we've be able to make this kind of thing accessible to them because right now it's hard to build distributed applications and it's hard to build smart contracts in Ethereum and that kind of thing and we're really trying to make this accessible. So what's what's so exciting for me about this work is that you're doing is that it really is based on nature and nature doesn't have boundaries in the way that our geopolitical boundaries have been created and maintained. And so uh, I, I suppose in my heart, I feel that the protectionism that, uh, that seems to be uh, part of what is happening right now, uh, we need to demonstrate what it is to be open what it is to share our information and, and to cooperate rather than be competitive because we've, I, I feel like we've come to the limits of that competition and that we need to work together. Yeah, well, the interesting thing for me about what you're saying is 
we have modeled these things on, on nature because nature is the place where we've seen systems that we can learn from that operate on large scale in collaborative manner, right? Like the cells in our body, trillions of cells all collaborate to make this crazy thing possible, you know, without a boss cell, without it being about a central control systems for certain types of information management, but that's not the same as the level of cellular management, right? And, um, but what you're pointing to is interesting because I think natural systems do have membranes, but all membranes are permeable and temporary, right? The, and part of how you manage the interface and interaction and collaboration of things is with membranes and within membranes, yeah. right? Like some membranes, cell membranes, select certain types of things to pull through the cell membrane. So they filter and they transform certain things as they come through the cell membrane. And they, right, like, so membranes are still important. Yes. Um, but they're not jurisdictional in the same way. There's also agency that crosses membranes. Yes. You know, and so one of the things about um, Holochain that's different than blockchain is blockchain tends to take a big monolithic approach. Like all the Ethereum smart contracts run on one big Ethereum blockchain in one big virtual, you know, Ethereum virtual machine. Um, where in Holochain, part of why it's scalable is every Holochain runs in its own DHT, its own address space, and you can manage a membrane around that. You could say that every Holochain is a private Holochain. Right. Now, joining a private Holochain may be as easy right now as joining the internet. You just basically have to have a, an IP address, right? Like it's not that there has to be a, a difficult membrane to cross. Right. Or joining a Holochain could have requirements of an invitation with a certain key and, you know, validating your identity and proof of citizenship or blah, blah, blah. Like you can make that membrane as thick as you need to or as transformational. Like you have to go through certain steps to come through the membrane to be recognized by the space inside, right? Um, and being able to have different membranes allows for completely different dynamics. In particular, we think that it's possible to do governance of these things in a more self-organizing manner because you're doing governance at the level of social coherence, at the level of social relevance for, the, for what that whole chain is doing. We don't have to change all of you know, the Ethereum blockchain to change something about how we're going to interact in, in our space. Yes. So uh, you have a huge body of work that you have created in your life. So it's, 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 but I want to drop in on a couple of pieces. So there's the Metacurrency project from which came Scepter, from which has come the Holochain. And so I'd like to I'd like to just share my understanding of what the sorry holochain is, and what I see it as is a way for any individual to be able to have their own machine environment that's like a blockchain, so that you can uh, so that you can control your own data security and be able to interact with groups of people and information in ways that are relevant and appropriate, as well as sovereign and accountable. So for me, it creates this space of a commons that is individual centric in terms of sovereignty, but allows that group coherence to be opt in for people to choose to relate the information that's relevant to what they're doing. So I see this beautiful 
uh, modeling of nature in a transition into a technological space that provides the basis for us to be able to um, create those environments and relationships online uh, and to uh, and to be a really important part of the transition from the uh, from the competitive corporate way that our that our systems have been have been have evolved into something that is more meaningful to each person and I see that transition as really important in terms of where we are right now uh, so that's why I'm most ex you know I, I really want to get a sense of how that's and and relate to people how that may be relevant uh, to what's happening right now in the world yeah uh, I mean for one thing it seems like you have have done your homework I know we've talked a bunch over the years but um, you know that you have taken steps to understand what we're doing and where it's coming from you know like I think that in the end people underestimate the importance of what your design is sourced in yeah. you know and it's like the idea that we could turn to blockchain for community applications on top of anonymous digital tokens that have taken all people out of the ontology. Now we have to try to add people back in and try to add community on top of that, you know, when fundamentally it wasn't designed for that. You yes. Know, yes. Um, is, I think, an uphill battle. I think that a lot of groups who are excited about the shift in power dynamics that becomes available in a decentralized system, yes. they want they know that we want to be able to hold things with new power dynamics. I think blockchain is the way to do that, but I think there's going to be a bit of a harsh reality check on you know these systems that try to do that and don't scale and are expensive to operate and are damaging to the environment for all the you know mining and hashing that that has been built into many of the approaches when there are really kind of smooth simple elegant approaches that we can learn from nature yeah. and uh, that um, already bring the kinds of patterns we are trying to reduplicate in our computing architectures now. Um, yeah. so, so I think yeah, coming from doing that makes a difference. Yes, uh, one of my one of my colleagues and good friends, Don Morrison, who is the founder and chair of the working group on indigenous food sovereignty, which is another space of really important uh, work to. To, to bring to the world, uh, one of the th questions she asks in terms of anything she does is for whom and for what for? And so, so in, in making your work really understandable to a broader group of people, you know, that's part of what, what, I'm, what I'm looking to relate is for whom and for what for? Uh, and when I see your work, I see that it is for everyone to reorient ourselves to the natural systems and to model our technology on on something that actually puts puts us and the natural world in the center rather than uh, non-human persons under the law that has been a, a, a group of what are considered persons uh, that has deeply skewed right. our how it is that we relate in the world and in meaningful ways in terms of how our economy works so I see your work as really critical to help us to transition to a commons because it's modeling it from within the frame itself. Um, can you just share a little bit yeah. about uh, what, so this summer you've had this group of people that are, that are designing and developing the whole chain. Uh, and what, you know, what are you working on right now? And, and what do you need? What's, you know, what are you, what are you working towards? In right now 
Well, right now we are about to do an alpha rollout, an alpha launch of, of Holochain. We're finishing up some security audit type things that we want to do just before putting it out there so that we can vouch for it having a basic adequate level of security. I mean, it has like end-to-end -end encryption and all that kind of stuff, but, but just even doing some protection of it on your own device in case you lose your device do you do you turn over all of your data to somebody else or you know um, and we've been working on some core applications that run on holochain that we think most other applications are going to want to use so things like indexing across a distributed system can be tricky yes. you know um, so if you you expect instantaneous google search type results across a system that's spread across hundreds of thousands of machines, potentially, you know, you need an application that can do indexing like that across the systems. You need ways of doing key management and managing identity across polo chains and um, being able to, like an example I was giving, if you're running holo chain app on your phone and you know, your phone, you lose your phone, you know, you don't want whoever finds your phone to be able to take over all of your identity by having your keys and all that stuff on there. You want to be able to revoke those keys and regain control of your stuff, even if you never get your phone back. Um, and so having a way of doing key management that's decentralized as well has been yeah. something that has been elusive for yeah. us in this age as we move into cryptographic stuff. And um, our app store is another one of the things, kind of the, the holochain of holochains by which we can distribute distributed software, right? Like, um, <laughs> is that's another one of the pieces we've built so that we can, you can just install holochain with the app store and then you can install any other holochain that has been shared there um, as, as a way of being able to kind of bootstrap your way into holochain. So we've been, where we're at is at a place of actually trying to make this more usable and accessible in particular for, for early developers that, that need some of these underlying services. You don't want to have everybody have to rebuild each time. Um, and so that's where we are in the, in the technology development, but we've also been building a communications team that's trying to help us figure out how the heck to talk about this stuff without overwhelming people with technical jargon and you know how to make the value proposition clear such that we can invite people in to come play and to support it and to become stakeholders invest in the future their future participation in this kind of system and um the campus that we've had the little uh the live work residency space we lose this house that I'm in at this moment, um, September 1st, the owners are gonna put it on the market and sell it. And so our lease is up and we have to move out. And we actually wanna use that as an opportunity to kind of bring a bulk of the team to um, a place where preferably there's some good and fun um, collaboration with other like spirited projects, but also to do this in a more global setting outside of the, the US. And um, we're looking primarily at Europe, although we're also looking at Montreal right now. Oh, right? yes. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's, it's a fun stage to be in. So next week, actually, a lot of our team is going to scatter go back home and you know sort of scatter for a couple of weeks and then we're gonna reconvene someplace we don't know yet that's exciting and yeah it's uh powerful to be in a space of not knowing but still deeply committed yeah yeah we have a little page on holochain.org about you know do you want to host the next holochain headquarters you know like if you see you might want to start kind of an incubator of holochain applications because i i think and of course i'm completely biased that we will overtake blockchain applications and that type of stuff especially for 
non-monetary applications. Blockchain so far is almost all about money and much of what we need to do isn't just about money. We need other ways of sharing and collaborating and, you know, um, and Holochain is focused on being able to enable all of those without it being all money centric. Um, so which is ironic, since it comes out of a currency project, right? The meta currency project. Yeah. So in terms of what you need for space, um, space for 10 to 20 people to live and work. Yeah, about 12 to 15, we expect most of the time, live and work if we can have live space nearby workspace or if we can have a couple live workspaces nearby each other or something like that. Um, we're looking at, you know, retreat centers and monasteries and houses and Airbnbs and, you know, like uh, we're looking at a bunch of those kinds of things, uh, have some interesting possibilities with um, spaces that are that are emerging really for these kinds of intentions like we have actually a bunch of invitations from Belgium um, for places that are starting up co-working spaces and and different types of maker spaces and people who are really interested in the holochain kind of technology uh, in Ghent and in Brussels um, but those things don't at the moment include living spaces so we have to like find the living space as well and um, but then there's some some other opportunities like in Porto, Portugal and um, Northern France where there's like a big, a big chateau, you know, <laughs> type of place with lots of space. Um, and uh, yeah, we just are still sorting it out. Yes. Uh, well, that's exciting. And um, <coughs> And yeah, I guess we'll we'll catch up on that story as it happens. Yeah, um, but if you you happen to catch this broadcast, this recording before September of 2017 or early September 2017, and you know that you want to bring these kinds of things into a space that that you've got, contact us through holochain.org. Wonderful. Thank you. And in terms of the crowdfunding campaign, uh, how, maybe you just talk a little bit about that and what it's looking to fund. Um, we, Holochain is already, like I said, to alpha and, or we're about to release it at alpha, and um, it's open source and we're not looking to fund Holochain. What we are looking to fund is a hosting framework that runs on Holochain that allows people to play who haven't installed a full Holochain node. So let me back up and say what that means. Holochain, the reason it doesn't have a currency at, at the center like blockchain does, is that it's designed to be completely peer-to-peer. -peer. So imagine running Facebook in a way where I control, I bring my own hosting capacity, but it, that hosting capacity is small enough that it can run on my laptop or my phone or a little tiny plug computer that I can plug into my internet router. You know, that can be my little home base foothold on the internet. Um, and, and yet everybody's not ready to install an application like that. Many, most people who want to use Facebook or something along those lines, they just want to type a URL into their browser. So to be able to make it possible to onboard people or make it accessible to people um, that aren't installing Holochain as an application, we need other people to carry additional hosting load. Yes. And similar to like mining in Bitcoin where you get paid for doing this work, our intention with this hosting infrastructure is you get paid for carrying the additional load beyond your share, right? By sharing the extra bandwidth storage processing power on the little plug computer that you put into your internet router, you know, you plug into your internet router. Um, by sharing that, you can earn some extra money. So this hosting infrastructure does have a currency, 
built into it for being able to do all that kind of micro credits and instead of a proof of work or proof of stake or anything like that, you, you actually are paid via a proof of service, basically the signed service logs of the service that you provided to people. So if you're running, for example, a an Airbnb without the company in the middle, right? You want to do a completely a commons peer-to-peer -peer held Airbnb. There's a revenue model for that um, for that structure, and therefore you can pay people who are going to host help host that infrastructure, so that others who don't host the infrastructure and just want to come in through a web browser can. Right. Um, and we think that this will actually start to create a whole kind of viable alternative to cloud computing. Right. So you, people go put their servers at Amazon or Google or whatever because infrastructure is hard to build and those big companies have built scalable infrastructure that now I don't have to manage. Well, we're trying to build Holo, um, the hosting side of this, as a similar um, automatic infrastructure, right? It auto scales um, across many thousands or tens of thousands of devices because of the architecture of the application itself. Okay. And so the the funding is needed to be able to pay people, but there's also the work that people are doing to do that. So what do you need in terms of of people power uh, to build out the build out holo? Um, we still need developers. Yeah. We're always looking for developers. Um, we need communicators. We need application developers, people who want who know about a problem that they want to solve, and uh, especially are are drawn toward solving that in a decentralized way, in something that can be held together, or, or want to play with new patterns of governance and organization um, that are possible when everybody is truly peer to peer without a you know centralized um, power structure, um, and. We're, all, we're also looking for um, early hosts and users, people who want to jump into playing on these systems or want to, you know, spend a little bit of money to have a box and then, you know, earn money. Because one, one of the things is we think once we get these boxes out into homes, that it becomes something that's essentially impossible to shut down. Yes. You know, like there's crosses jurisdictions it, it you know it, in a way that um, you could go into Amazon and shut something down you know like the government could go in with a subpoena and basically shut down this this server to go into thousands or tens of thousands of homes across the country or across other countries you know you, the, this is in some ways the 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 anti-authoritarian dream of really being able to have something that goes outside of the boundaries of any particular authority, this is that kind of architecture. And, and it really feels like what the internet was created to be. So I feel there's exactly. a return to the original intentions of the power of yeah. the internet. Yeah, Tim Berners-Lee, when he made HTTP, his server was his desktop computer. You know, the intention was that we could share these things directly. It wasn't that it was going to all go into big centralized data centers and big corporations that, you know, but our architectures so far have not modeled in the scalable ways that nature has for how to do centralization or decentralization. And uh, that's what we've done with Holochain. So in terms of the, the box, would this be, could this be like I go out and for 35 bucks buy a Raspberry Pi, a little microcomputer, and have that plug in? Or what do you mean when you say box? We are probably going to have a few different levels of boxes. Um, one is more like the Raspberry Pi level, although it may be built on an 
Odroid. We're trying to finalize the hardware spec on that. But yeah, a $35, $40 microcomputer board, that, um, that would be the bare bones version where you um, would have to plug in a hard drive separately and you know that kind of thing. Um, but a $35 board also needs memory and um, a case and some things like that. So we're looking at getting one out there that's a bare bones system for less than $100. Um, and then probably one that's a little bit less than a few hundred dollars that already comes with everything you need. It comes with terabytes of disk space and you know more memory and processing power than the little micro card you know does. And then we may have a premium model that has even more bells and whistles on it, and um, it is, looks sexier. <laughs> you know, for those that that uh, want to be able to show it off or something like that. Right. And so, great. That seems that so there is a, a sort of revenue generation plan in terms of the ability for people to be able to have some sustainable income come through hosting this in a dis distributed way. Yes. As far as our revenue goes, we are not expecting to make much money off of the crowdfunded hardware and offerings in that space. Yeah, we're going to price them with some margin, but we know that delivering hardware and everything often runs into glitches and we kind of expect all of that money to get eaten up and just trying to deliver that stuff to people. But that's an important part of what we want to do is we want to have that kind of, you know, fully distributed architecture out there. Yes. Um, and uh, the, <laughs> the, other place, the other place that we're getting funding or money is by doing a, an ICO, an initial community offering, not an initial coin offering, because we're not a coin-based system. We're an agent-based system um, of people being able to basically pre-purchase hosting credit um, in this distributed hosting system. Um, and uh, so we're going to do that, those two things in conjunction with each other and have the ICO be coupled to the crowdfunding campaign where the crowdfunding campaign is what is demonstrating the demand and scales the level of capitalization, the, the supply of the, of the um, tokens that are being sold um, in the ICO. So how can people help and how can I help? Well, you're already helping by, by helping tell the story, by asking good questions, by understanding, by sharing, you know, in, your, in the credit union you're on the board of and different things like that with, with groups that are trying to solve different problems. You know, obviously we're building this to try to help solve a bunch of different problems. And so by, by understanding what problems it solves and telling the people that, that, that need that, that's actually very helpful. Um, cause it's a confusing world out there of these different options. Um, what are the other ways people can help? They can uh, host well, our team. Yes. They can. Spread. Sorry, that would, that the internet just got a bit. Yeah, no, the internet just got a little bit glitchy there. Um, but yes, hosting teams, um, checking out the both the initial community offering and the crowdfunding campaign for the distributed uh, hosting, HOLO. Um, also through, if you are a developer and you see this as something that's exciting and you want to participate, get in touch and jump in. Yes. And we have... Um, different levels of development. Like if you know Go and want to work on the core underlying cryptographic layer, great. If you know JavaScript and want to build apps on top of, you know, the whole chain, great. Um, we may have other engines. I mean, we, we have a Lisp engine as well if you want to write an app in Lisp. Uh, we, may, we may be adding other virtual machines so you can write in other languages. 
uh, but that's what we have so far. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for doing a bit of a deep dive into, into what's happening. And I think that this work that you're doing is, is really deeply transformative on so many levels. The people that are involved, what people are bringing to the table in terms of work and, and designing systems that truly uh, model both nature and what is needed right now. And what I think is so exciting right now is that people are investing themselves into these things that they can see model a new way of being together. So thank you so much to you and your team and all the people that have contributed to Sector, the whole chain, metacurrency, and and all the the people that are are doing other work that I think can connect to this. So thank you. Until next time. Thank you, Tammy. <laughs>